Hi, my name is Kyle Julian, and I'm a PhD student with Michael Kokenderfer at Stanford University. And today I'll be presenting my DAS 2020 paper, Image-Based Guidance of Autonomous Aircraft for Wildfire Surveillance and Prediction. Wildfires have had a devastating effect in the US and around the world, burning millions of acres and costing billions in damages. So the question I've been interested in is how can we use aircraft, and in particular, small fixed wing unmanned aircraft in order to help fight these fires. So one way is to have a small aircraft surveying the perimeter of the fire, updating firefighters where the fire front is and helping them to make informed decisions and how to best combat the fires. Uh, but with what, just one aircraft, you don't really get a lot of benefit. Uh, ideally, you would like to use a whole team of aircraft uh, continually uh, monitoring the fires or um, going in dangerous places where it'd be difficult to send manned aircraft. Using unmanned aircraft to survey wildfires presents a few technical challenges. First, you have to plan and control using images because we don't know where the fires are ahead of time. And so we need to take in the images from onboard sensors on the aircraft and use those inf that information in order to make decisions. This fire boundary can evolve over time. And so we need the aircraft to be able to, to adapt and react and to maybe go visit other areas of the fire front uh, over time in order to monitor any updates. And we would also want some coordination between aircraft, uh, either explicitly or implicitly, in order to make sure that the aircraft are uh, being utilized as effectively as possible in order to monitor the wildfire. So these kinds of challenges are also present in other types of applications beyond just wildfire surveillance, such as search and rescue, construction site survey, or infrastructure inspection. And these are applications in which you would want to use images or information that you gather in real time in order to change the plan or uh, control your aircraft uh, in real time without having a, a human pilot having to control every action that you do. One way to approach this problem is to use the control architecture described here. Uh, and although this is written for the wildfire problem, this could be expanded to other types of image-based multi-agent aircraft problems like I was just describing. So you first have to define a simulator, in this case, a wildfire simulator and an aircraft simulation. Uh, you then need to define some image processing, which would define how we take raw images and produce wildfire observations, which is observations of the locations of uh, where fire is or is not. You would then have some filtering in order to compile these observations into a map of the wildfire uh, that spans over multiple observations and even includes wildfire locations that haven't been observed in a while. We can then take that belief map and as well as the relative state of the other aircraft. So we can combine this into uh, both sets of information into one control system using a neural network. And the output would be a bank angle command or it could be some other type of signal that steers the aircraft. So now I'll go through talking in more depth about each of these different components. So first I'll describe the simulation framework. This is the wildfire simulator and the aircraft simulation. We use the, a simple probabilistic wildfire simulator, which divides the air, area up into a lot of uh, discrete cells. And within each cell, uh, it could either be burning or not burning. And burning cells continue to burn um, until all of the fuel is depleted. And also uh, burning cells could ignite uh, other neighboring cells. So we can take a look at, in the nominal simulation, uh, this wildfire grows in this ring, uh, expanding outwards, and uh, the cells continue to burn until all the fuel is depleted. But we can model wind um, by biasing the expansion of this wildfire in different directions. So we can model uh, wind pushing the fire towards the east, in this case, by making it more likely that the uh, eastern cells uh, catch fire and the western cells do not. And so in this simulator, the aircraft can observe the wildfire map, but cannot observe the fuel map or the underlying wind parameters that are governing this expansion. The aircraft model is a simple model where we assume that the aircraft maintains an altitude of 200 meters, a steady level of flight at 20 meters per second, and can bank uh, up to 50 degrees in order to turn and then it will take action selected at a frequency of 10 hertz. And these actions are going to be bank angle commands, 
uh, that either decrements or increments the banking angle by five degrees. So then you would have some PD controller trying to track that banking angle command in order to steer the aircraft. So in the future, we'll talk about how uh, we can incorporate some of the pairwise information uh, in order to make this a multi-agent uh, problem. In that case, we would uh, just take all the information relative to the aircraft we're controlling, so we can get the relative position um, and heading direction of the other aircraft, as well as the bank angles of the two aircraft. And so we assume that the aircraft are communicating and working together, and that the aircraft we're controlling has access to this information about the other aircraft. In addition, we're assuming that the other aircraft is going to be controlled by the same policy that we're using. So next, we need to model how the aircraft is going to perceive the wildfire. So in this case, we're going to model the cameras a little bit and say that there's four cameras that are pointing in different directions, looking mostly forward and then outwards, left to right, or mostly center. And we're going to limit the observations to be within 300 meters which represents a horizon or not being able to see very far in the distance. Now we could approach this problem in different ways. We could redo this analysis with different numbers of cameras pointing in different directions, uh, but the same approach would be valid. The key idea though is that as the aircraft is banking left or then right, the area in which we're going to observe is going to change in response to the banking of the aircraft. These are cameras that are fixed to the body of the aircraft and so they have to rotate along with the aircraft. So I've described the uh, simulator and the wildfire and aircraft. Now I'll talk a little bit about the image processing. How do we go from the raw camera images to wildfire observations? Our image processing is really simple. And that's because we're using a really simple wildfire simulation. And so we're kind of omitting this component, but assuming that uh, if we were to use a realistic wildfire simulation, then we would be able to use some of the methods that are in the literature in order to compute uh, which uh, pixels are on fire or not on fire. But we're going to model a little bit of noise by saying that uh, in 10 percent of the pixels we make the wrong observation. So this is a way to model some uncertainty and the ability to uh, parse out the uh, burning cells. So next I'll talk about filtering, which is to say, how do we go from those observations of the wildfire that has some noise in them and compute this belief map of the fire, which we can update over time and update collaboratively with multiple aircraft. There's two approaches that we take to filter these observations into a belief map. And the first is based on the extended Kalman filter. If we were to represent the uh, entire uh, fire distribution as a giant state, it would be thousands of dimensions because we have thousands of cells. And so these uh, part of this extended Kalman filter update would be uh, very computationally uh, intractable. So we got around this by assuming that each uh, cell acts independently, at least when modeling this EKF. And so we're losing some information as to how these uh, cells propagate and there's and the correlation between neighboring cells but we're able to reduce these, uh, the computation needed for the EKF. So how that works is that we would maintain uh, some probabilities, these some mean probabilities of the wildfire, as well as uh, standard deviations. But then uh, we can threshold those mean probabilities in order to generate an estimate of the wildfire map. But when we get an observation, which could have some errors, we're going to use the, the extended Kalman filter update equations in order to update these mean probabilities as well as the standard deviations. Um, and then we can threshold this uh, updated probabilities in order to get a more accurate uh, belief map. And so uh, as we get more and more observations, we can continue this approach and we can always threshold our probabilities in order to predict what, where the wildfire it is at any given time. So I'll show a quick demonstration video of this EKF in action. We're showing four plots here. The upper left is the true wildfire map, and the boxed uh, regions um, in front of each aircraft are the areas being observed. We have the wildfire probabilities from the EKF in the upper right. We are thresholding them in the bottom left to show the predictions of where we think the fire is burning. And then we make that image relative to the um, aircraft being controlled. So I'm showing it for the black aircraft, but we would do this also for the cyan aircraft. And it's this relative belief map that we're going to give to the neural network controller. The idea is that we're always going to make the information relative to the aircraft 
um, so that it's easier for the neural network to make decisions. So as we play this, simu uh, this video, we see that as we make observations, we're able to update the probabilities um, and get a better estimate for our belief map. However, we're not able to, to update the fire in unobserved locations. And so this is a limitation that can be addressed by the particle filter. When using a particle filter, we are going to maintain separate simulations of the wildfire within a, and have one particle for each simulator. So for example, we could have one particle in which we uh, model the, an eastern wind. So we have to model all of the underlying simulator variables as well, even the ones that we don't observe. Uh, so we can initially say it's a probability 0.5, and for particle 2, we could say it also has a probability 0.5. And in this case, just for example, has a western wind. So we can try a lot of different particles that kind of represent the different kinds of wildfires that we could see and expand the area of uncertainty. So there are two things that we do once we get an observation. And the first is to update the particle's likelihood uh, based on how likely it would be to produce that observation. So with particle one, there's not a lot of uh, high probability of fire being in the locations that we have observed fire. So we would decrease that uh, probability and for particle two, there was a uh, high probability of fire being in the locations that we observed. So it would be an increase in probability of that particle. And then second, we can update the mean probabilities themselves given the observation so that we can keep the particle filter up to date with the observations that we're seeing. But as a result of this process, we're able to get uh, a good probabilistic estimate of the fires. Uh, not only in the places that we observe, but also in the places we don't observe because these particle filters are themselves simulations, which we can just simply advance in time, even when we don't observe them. We can also get estimates of the underlying parameters that we can't observe, such as wind, and because we have a distribution of these, of these particles, and these particles um, have the uh, wind modeled as well. So next I'll talk about this neural network controller, which is going to take in information, uh, this relative information of the state of the other aircraft, as well as the relative belief map, and output a control signal, in this case, a bank angle command. I won't have a lot of time to describe how deep reinforcement learning works, but I'll just give a few of the, the high level takeaways and the key ideas. So first we need to define a reward model, uh, which is rewards for good behavior or penalties for bad behavior. And in this case, that's going to be penalty for getting near other aircraft, a reward for observing new wildfire, or a penalty for flying directly over the wildfire. And that last component is something that we can tune, and we're gonna talk a little bit about more later in this talk. We're giving a penalty because it could be dangerous to fly directly over the fire where there's a lot of turbulence or heat being generated, and it could be dangerous for the aircraft. So the whole goal of deep key learning is to learn this uh, Q function where that's represented by a neural network, and this Q function is a mapping from state uh, to, to values, and which are uh, the values of taking the action in, in that state. So the state in this case is going to be uh, two components to it. It's going to be information about the uh, other aircraft relative to the onship that we're controlling, as well as the belief image uh, relative to the onship which we're controlling. So the idea is that we uh, use the simulator in the loop to generate a lot of trajectories, and uh, train this uh, neural network uh, through a gradient descent method in order to produce uh, better and better estimates of these Q values, which allow us to perform uh, better and take actions that are accumulating as much reward as possible over time. So I won't have enough time today to describe neural networks in a lot of detail either, um, but the main idea is that it's composed of these layers that have uh, linear uh, functions of the, of the previous inputs with some weights, and so those weights are the parameters of the, of the network, followed by nonlinear activations, in this case, ReLU activations. And so we have both uh, state variables, such as uh, position and heading direction of the other aircraft, as well as the bank angles. And we also have the belief map. So we have two modalities, both uh, a low-dimensional state, as well as an image. So we can feed them both into the neural network by having separate input branches to the network, before they are concatenated together and eventually produce a final output. And so through training, we can update the weights and parameters of this network so that we can get well-performing Q-value estimates from the network. The EKF 
neural network took 12 hours to train. And what I'll show here is a, a simulation. We'll see that uh, initially the aircraft are pointed towards each other, so they come really close. But the Cyan aircraft does this turning maneuver in order to hold its trajectory before following along the fire front. This allows it to gain separation from the black aircraft so that they can uh, make separate and distinct uh, observations of the wildfire, which allows them to observe new wildfire uh, at the same time, so that their observations aren't redundant. And then in addition, they follow along the wildfire boundary, not getting too close to it or flying directly over it, so that's uh, also good. And the inter, the inner area of the wildfire is not updated as frequently, so sometimes there is some um, leftover fire, um, but that is something that can be uh, a limitation that can be overcome by the particle filter or just by assuming that fire's interior of the fire front eventually will be extinguished. We can also simulate the particle filter, which used 20 particles. And in this case, it took about one to two days to train before uh, converging to a, a good performance. And it takes longer because we have to do all this computation to uh, simulate all these wildfires. Here's you know, one wildfire uh, being simulated for each particle. So we'll show a video of uh, the uh, particle filter uh, neural network. And the true wildfire map is in the upper left. The thresholded uh, belief map coming from the particle filter is in the upper right, with the raw probability shown in the lower left. And we can also estimate the wind just by uh, uh, looking at the likelihood of these different particles and the wind uh, at which these particles are being used to, to generate their simulations. So as we see in this case, the black aircraft does a holding maneuver um, to let the cyan aircraft get farther away before uh, starting to follow along the fire front. In this case, both the aircraft are flying um, alongside at a, at a comfortable distance away from the fire uh, such that it's close enough to be able to observe the fire without flying directly over the fire. And the resulting belief map is a lot more accurate than the extended Kalman filter because we're able to update the fire in cells that we don't directly observe. This is one of the advantages of using the particle filter. We can also look at the trajectories generated by different methods as well as some baseline methods. We find that the particle filter and Kalman filter vastly outperform the receding horizon controller and the heuristic controller which tend to perform greedily and don't take actions that are going to perform well in the long term. We also find that the particle filter generates smoother trajectories than the uh, Kalman filter. And this might be because the particle filter naturally smooths out the belief map more than the, the Kalman filter does. And as a result, uh, the trajectories generated following a smoother boundary are going to be smoother themselves. So if we remove that penalty term for flying over the wildfire, the behavior changes uh, drastically. Now the neural network's behavior is to kind of stay towards the center of the fire and to do circles uh, kind of behind the boundary of the fire in order to observe more locations at the same time. Uh, but in this scenario, the uh, neural networks are still outperforming the receding horizon as well as the heuristic models as well. We can also gather some performance metrics to more quantitatively compare these different approaches. And so first we trained a few different models and tuned a few different uh, controllers uh, using different thresholds for uh, tolerance of flying over the fire. And so we are creating these uh, Pareto fronts. And what we find is that the uh, EKF and particle filter are dominating the other approaches and all these different metrics. And that's in this case, the fire cells observed, we'd like to observe as much fire as possible. The belief map error, we'd like to minimize and the EKF struggles here because it's not able to update the fire in unobserved locations. So we could uh, try to improve that result by uh, just assuming that the fire has extinguished in places that we know are burning a long time in the past. Uh, but the particle filter can handle this very naturally. And in addition, the EKF can't predict the wind on its own, but using the particle filter, we can get a good estimate for the wind prediction. We can also uh, test the tolerance to image uh, noise. So we were using 10% noise uh, as our baseline, but we can increase this up to 25%, and we don't really see a lot of uh, effect on the performance of the neural networks. 
But once we get to around 35% of error, uh, we start to have a lot of false positives in our belief map and the neural network uh, trajectory starts to really deviate uh, from what we would have seen with fewer errors. And so this shows that the neural network policy uh, can be very robust uh, to these image processing errors, which may help us uh, in cases where there is a lot of smoke or uncertainty in these images. So to conclude, we presented a deep reinforcement learning approach to train this neural network controller that is able to control a small fixed wing aircraft to observe a wildfire. In order to do this, we had to uh, filter the observations into a belief map and we looked at uh, extended Kalman filter or a particle filter. What we found is that the particle filter is able to outperform the extended Kalman filter and is able to make predictions on some unobserved variables, but it requires more computation. However, both of these methods were able to outperform baseline approaches and resulted in interesting trajectories such as the aircraft holding before uh, continuing to observe the fire or to uh, follow along the fire front from a safe distance. So there's some areas for future work. Uh, we could uh, try applying this work to other problem domains and incorporate more uh, realistic wildfire or smoke models. Uh, once we've incorporated more realistic models, we can start to look at the image processing step. And then there's always going to be the question of how do these simulation trained neural networks translate to the real world? And there's lots of questions and future work to be done in that area as well. So thank you for listening to my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it.